Hello and welcome back to Flip Psychology. I'm Miss Lee and in this video we're going to be talking about psychological disorders. This is section one so we've started a brand new unit. This section is going to focus on basically an introduction kind of an overarching look at what psychological disorders are. Our objectives include describing and discussing psychologically abnormal behavior, examining how the stigma impacts relationships. We're going to describe historical and cross-cultural views of abnormality and the major models of abnormality. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and grab your notes and let's get started. Okay, so why study psychological disorders? Well, first of all, people are fascinated by the exceptional, the unusual, the abnormal, the outliers, the fringe. This fascination can be caused by a few reasons. First off, at any given moment, we all feel, think, and act like an abnormal individual. That's just kind of human nature. Additionally, psychological disorders may bring unexplained physical symptoms, irrational fears, and suicidal thoughts. There are more than 450 million people suffering from psychological disorders. And finally, depression and schizophrenia exist in all cultures of the world. So these disorders are very widespread. So let's talk about what it even means to be normal. First of all, you've got a couple of qualifiers about what abnormal behavior might look like. The first one would be so social nonconformity. This is disobeying societal standards for normal conduct. This is usually going to lead to destructive or self-destructive behavior. Situational context, the social situation, the behavioral setting, or general circumstances where an action is taking place. For example, is it normal to walk around strangers naked? Well, if you're in a locker room and in the shower area, maybe. Um, <laughs> The slide said, says yes, but it really kind of even then depends. So you have to look at the context of where the behavior is taking place. And then cultural relativity. Judgments are made relative to the values of one's culture. What's appropriate and acceptable in one culture may not be in another culture. So you have to take that into account. So what is psychologically abnormal behavior? The American Psychological Association publishes what we call the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. On your screen, you will see a picture of the current edition and this is how we deem behavior to be abnormal. Mental health workers view psychological disorders as persistently harmful thoughts, feelings, or actions. But when behavior is deviant, distressful, and dysfunctional, psychiatrists and psychologists typically label it as disordered. So let's talk about the prevalence of psychopathology. How prevalent are psychological disorders? Well, in America, mental illness is far more common than most people realize. Over 15% of the population suffers from diagnosable mental health problems. Another study found that during any given year, the behaviors of over 56 million Americans meet the criteria for a diagnosable psychological disorder. Over the lifespan, as many as 32% of Americans suffer from psychological disorders. That's a third of us. That's a lot. So let's Let's talk about stigma. First of all, what is stigma? There are two types of stigma. There's public stigma and self-stigma. Public stigma involves the negative or discriminatory attitudes that others have about mental illness. However, self-stigma refers to the negative attitudes, including internalized shame that people with mental illness have about their own condition. It impacts relationships in a number of different ways, but research that has been done on stigma's impact has concluded that there are three basic categories of how stigma can impact relationships. People will respond to someone with mental illness with fear and exclusion, with authoritarianism or with benevolence. One of these categories typically applies to people and how they respond to people with mental illness. There's a fear factor there. There's this idea that people with mental illness should be kept out of the community. There is this idea that people with mental illness are irresponsible, that somehow they've made some bad choice and that life decisions should be made by others. And then finally, that people with severe mental illness are childlike and need to be taken care of. So these are three different 
types of stigma, all harmful in their own ways. So let's look back at how we have viewed psychological disorders. Historically, we treated mental illness with very barbaric means. This included trephination, which is basically boring holes into the skull to remove evil forces. We've actually seen evidence of this in human remains. Exorcism, being caged like animals, being beaten, being burned, being castrated, being mutilated, and being transfused with animals' blood, all of which were done without the consent of the individual. So how did people end up in mental hospitals? Well, our history of mental hospitals actually isn't really all that long. Um, the Society of Friends, or the Quakers, here in the United States opened the first private institution in 1813. The oldest government-run institution is St. Elizabeth's in Washington, D.C. Basically, people could be committed for any reason. Commitment is being placed involuntarily in a hospital setting. Historically, men who wanted a divorce could have their wife committed, and girls who became pregnant out of wedlock could become committed. Going back a little bit further, we have a very important individual named Philip Pinnell. At one time, he was the personal physician to Napoleon, so we're back in the late 1700s. He devoted his life to helping the mentally ill, and he at one point directed the Paris Men's Asylum. Patients before Pinnell had been chained to the wall for decades. Uh, the death rates for patients went from 60% to 10% during the time that he was in charge of the asylum. He was quoted as saying madness was not due to demonic possession, but an ailment of the mind. So we start going towards a more scientific view of mental illness. Here in the United States, Dorothea Dix um, was very important, was a very important figure to help reform inhumane treatment for psychological disorders. She began tutoring inmates at a women's prison, and what she found when she began her work was that the mentally ill women and men were being housed with hardened female criminals. She made important reforms to start addressing the mental illness, and she took those reforms to all existing states as well as Europe. So let's talk about cross-cultural views of abnormality. So when we go back to the definition of what it means to have a psychological disorder, you'll remember that we said that it was deviant, distressful, and dysfunctional. However, however, deviant behavior in one culture may be considered normal, while in others it may lead to arrest. There's an example, a picture here on your slide, of a tribe of men where they wear costumes to attract women. In Western society, this would be considered abnormal. But in all cultures, deviant behavior has to accompany distress to be considered a disorder. But at every level, if the behavior is dysfunctional, it is clearly a disorder. Let's talk about the major models of abnormality. And this is going to be sort of a review of the perspectives that we talked about in our very earliest videos. So you've got some psychological schools or perspectives. And then to the right in this chart, the different beliefs of the cause of the disorder. So in the psychoanalytic or psychodynamic, perspective. Basically, the cause of the disorder is internal unconscious drives, specifically drives that have not been even manifested yet in therapy. You've got the humanistic perspective. The cause of a disorder in this perspective, in this school of thought, is a failure to strive to one's potential or being out of touch with one's feelings. The behavioral school believes that the cause of the disorder is a history of being reinforced for the behavior that is dysfunctional, as well as influence from the environment. The cognitive perspective looks at irrational and dysfunctional thoughts or ways of thinking. The sociocultural perspective is basically that the individual is surviving in a dysfunctional society. And then finally, the biomedical or the neuroscience perspective. The cause here is organic problems, biochemical imbalances, and genetic predispositions to that disorder. An example is the biopsychosocial model. We've talked about this before. And in in this model of abnormality, you have several different influences. You've got biological influences, psychological influences, and social cultural influences. So take a few moments, pause the video, take a look over these characteristics of the different influences that all lead to the person being diagnosed with a psychological disorder. So thinking way back to the beginning of the video, I showed you a picture of our current DSM. The Diagnostic Statistical Manual is how we classify psychological disorders. And the American Psychological Association will periodically go back and edit this manual in order to be able to capture society kind of in that time frame. Just as a point of reference, our current edition describes 400 psychological disorders compared to only 60 
disorders in the 1950s. So that shows how complex diagnosis is, as well as a more informed way of looking at diagnosis. The DSM will classify disorders and describe the symptoms. However, the DSM will not explain the causes or possible cures. Some notable changes in this current edition is that we no longer refer to the particular disorder as mental retardation. We now call it intellectual disability. We see the addition of hoarding disorder, hypersexual disorder, and binge eating disorders, amongst others. There was also quite a large shakeup in how disorders are linked with other disorders and kind of placed in to similar categories. We will get into more details of that in future videos. So let's take a moment to review. What we talked about in this video are psychologically abnormal behaviors, stigma, historical and cross-cultural views of abnormality, as well as major models of abnormality and classification. In our next video, we'll be talking about anxiety disorders, phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. I can't wait to see you then. Bye for now.